I'd like to begin with Ms. Jocelyn Kelly, and she is a director of the Women in War program for Harvard University's Humanitarian Initiatives, where she designs and implements projects to examine issues relating to gender, peace, and security in fragile states. She has given briefings related to gender and security to the United Nations Security Council, the U.S. State Department, USAID, the World Bank, OFDA, and the Woodrow Wilson Center, and the U.S. Institute of Peace. Ms. Kelly's international work has focused on understanding the health needs of vulnerable populations in Eastern and Central Africa, and has included working with Uganda, Human Rights Commission to launch the first office in Africa promoting the right to health. Next to her is Dr. Elisa Forgi, and Elisa is director of the master's program of, on Holocaust and genocide at Stockton College. She also teaches on the comparative history of genocide. Her current research focuses on the ways in which perpetrators use family institutions and roles to torture their victims before killing them. These atrocities have occurred in cases of conflict that are not generally believed to constitute genocide, such as the Japanese sex slavery system in World War II and, most re and the most recent war in Sierra Leone, and can help us identify genocidal aspects to conflict that are not otherwise thought to be genocidal in nature. Her most recent publication is a chapter entitled Sexual Violence and Long-Term Genocide Prevention in the book Reconstructing Genocide Prevention by Cambridge. We follow with Dr. Edward Kissy. He's an associate professor of Africana Studies at the University of South Florida. His research focuses on the 20th century economic and diplomatic history of Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. History of U.S. foreign relations with Africa since the 20th century and the comparative history of genocide and human rights. He is the author of Revolution and Genocide in Ethiopia and Cambodia, 2006, and has published a number of articles and book chapters on genocide, famine, international relief aid, and the U.S. foreign policy toward Africa in the Cold War period. In 2009, Dr. Kissy wrote The Holocaust as a Guidepost for Genocide Detection and Prevention in Africa for the United Nations Discussions Papers Journal. And he has since been involved in UNESCO's ongoing initiatives on Holocaust and genocide education in Africa. And finally, Dr. Sonia Heschpeth. She is a professor of German at Middle Tennessee State University, where she has taught courses on the Holocaust since 1989. She is a co-editor with Rochelle Seidel of Sexual Violence Against Jewish Women During the Holocaust, Brande University Press. <coughs> Using testimonies, Nazi doc documents, memoirs, and artistic representations, this anthology by an interdisciplinary and international group of scholars addresses topics such as rape, forced prostitution, assaults on childbearing, artistic representations of sexual violence, and psychological insights into survivor trauma. These subjects have been relegated to the edges or completely left out of the Holocaust history. And this book aims to shift perceptions and promote a new discourse. And with that, I would ask Ms. Kelly to uh, begin. So the problem with having an introduction of all the other panelists is that now I'm extremely intimidated. <laughs> so, um, I just want to thank the organizers so much. It's just an extraordinary honor to be here with you today. And especially so because um, I've just come back from the field and I always just find it to be a um, privilege to be able to speak to an audience right when I've come back from um, working with communities who are affected by conflict and by genocidal violence and then to see people so extraordinarily interested and dedicated to this issue in what may seem very far away places gives me enormous hope. So thank you for being here. Um, so for over 10 years, I've worked in some of the most violent places in Africa. And my research has brought me close to many people who have survived violence and particularly um, gender-based violence. After working with women and men who experienced rape and sexual torture, I realized that in order to truly understand this abuse, its motivations and its patterns, one also has to speak to the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. 
This led me on a journey that began in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo when I started speaking to Mai Mai rebels about their command and control structures, their initiation rights, their behaviors, and their beliefs. Since then, I've spoken to rebels and soldiers throughout Africa to try and understand some of the sources of sexualized violence and conflict. Recently, I returned from Central African Republic and South Sudan. Um, I was doing work for a project to look at how communities affected by the Lord's Resistance Army, or LRA, um, respond to this kind of a threat. So as many of you probably know, the LRA is a tightly knit group with highly ritualized ideas and customs and a cult-like profile. It has some of the same characteristics as other extremist groups we see throughout the world, including Boko Haram and ISIS. When I was in LRA territory, I heard um, about the story of William, and his story typified the experience of many of the survivors I interviewed and many of its details. There was also something about a story that continues to stay with me to this day, and I think about his experience <coughs> often, um, almost, almost every day. So William was 14 years old when he was adopted into the LRA with five girls and five other boys, uh, aged 19 to 14. Now, a common strategy used by the LRA and other groups when they abduct new recruits is to try to break all ethnic, tribal, and social ties to your home and family. And they've evolved highly ritualized and systematic ways to make new recruits violent and to break any feelings of loyalty or mercy. When the LRA set up camp the first night after William and the other children were abducted, an older combatant came to brief them. His name was Faustin. He was from their country, the Central African Republic, from the same area where they'd been abducted. But he had risen to a high rank in the LRA, and he was there to publicly tell them to abandon all hope of getting home. He told them how one of them would be killed and the others would be held responsible, and they would be blamed if they ever tried to escape. He told them that their only loyalty, their only identity, their only family was now at the LRA, and he told them that they could never leave. Working with perpetrators of violence, I documented the ways that people become indoctrinated into systems that dehumanize others and promote cruelty. Women are central to these systems, and they're used in strategic and calculated ways to further the aims of armed groups. And indeed, sexual violence is distinct from other forms of violence, and it can destabilize communities in completely unique ways. This is because there are strong community mores against having sex outside of marriage. There is intense stigma associated with sexual violence. Many societies value women solely based on their reproductive health and exclusivity. Rape can lead to impregnation or having a child born of rape, and then these children are often stigmatized and then associated with a perpetrating group. And rape is associated with HIV and other sexually transmitted infections, so women who suffer this violence may be seen as not only morally, but also physically tainted. All of these things mean that sexual violence is a form of abuse that has a uniquely destructive profile mm -hmm. for individuals, families, and communities. It means that it can be a tool to destabilize society societies by exploiting taboos and striking at the sacred values and connections in a community. The definition of genocide acknowledges how gendered relations can inflict harm. Bosnia awakened the world's consciousness to how rape could be used as a weapon against people. After the Rwandan genocide, the trial of prosecutors versus Akayesu established the legal precedent that rape falls within the act of genocide. The presiding judge of the trial in a statement said, from time immemorial, rape has been regarded as spoils of war. Now it will be considered a war crime. We now face a new landscape of threat and vulnerability from violent extremist groups. These groups are often masters of psychological and emotional manipulation. They exploit gender in a way um, that is hard to understand, but is becoming a key tool in their arsenal. In a recent essay, the Special Representative on Sexual Violence and Conflict for the United Nations noted, a common factor that presages the rise of authoritarian and extremist movements is their assault on women's rights and freedom and that conflict is a license to reassert outmoded models of masculinity. Here are the things I think we can do to combat this new wave of extremist violence. Acknowledge that women's issues are security issues, and that security issues are women's issues. 
We must recognize that violence against women destabilizes countries and robs societies of their greatest asset. The UN Security Council Resolution 1825 was an unprecedented step to acknowledge this, and now we must act on it. Despite frequent lip service being paid to including women in peace processes and negotiations, we do a miserable job of making this a reality. This is despite clear evidence that including women in peace processes leads to more successful and lasting peace. This is one of the greatest failures of the current system of conflict resolution that we have. And until soldiers know that they will be held accountable to those that they abuse, the abuse will continue. Women must be represented in political systems and in the process of peace building, and in the process of building and when needed, rebuilding their societies. When extremist groups use women as tools to punish com communities, to reward soldiers, or to subjugate populations, there must be swift action from the international community and sustained effort to bring those, to ju those accountable to justice. Um, in closing, I'll just reflect for a moment on what else I've learned from more than a decade of working in conflict zones and from speaking to both perpetrators and victims of violence. I've learned that violence does beget violence and that conflict does feed on itself in cycles. It becomes entrenched in patterns of thinking and behavior and in economies and households. But I've also learned this, and this is the thing that brings me hope. No matter how dark the place or how long the conflict, I've met courage and audacity in every place I've worked. I call the heroes I meet the upstanders. And I found that even in the most elaborate systems designed to dehumanize and to destroy, there are people who will not give in. I told you about William and the 10 other children who've been abducted. I told you about Faustin, the high-ranking commander in the LRA. He spent days beating and indoctrinating the new recruits and warning them publicly of what would happen if they disobeyed the smallest detail. One night, when everyone was asleep and the unit was about to move on, Faustin found William, and he woke him up and all of the other children. He pointed into the forest in a particular direction, and he said, run. Run in this direction. The National Army is five miles away. If you go now, you can escape. The only reason we know about Faustin today is a fluke of fate. William survived and told someone about his experience. I like to think about all the other stories of courage that are never recounted and are lost in the dusty distance of war. I don't know where Faustin is now. William was reunited with his family. I'd like to think he's escaped the LRA and he's returned home. Or I like to think that he continues to survive in the group and is still helping children to escape. But I do know that there are people like him fighting against systems of violence in quiet and unrecognized ways. <coughs> and I also believe that we can do more as a global community to fight violence and injustice so people like Faustin and William don't have to fight alone. Well, thank you so much for that. This is really a wonderful panel, and I'm so honored to be here. And I really want to thank the, um, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here, and also for, for conceiving of a panel like this that allows us to discuss, uh, I think, some of the most productive research that's being done, not necessarily our own, but this idea of gender and genocide that's being done in terms of genocide prevention. And I think Jocelyn's work is a clear example of that and also a very hard act to follow, right? So I'm going to do my best. Um, I work on genocidal atrocities, so that's sort of the focus of my work. So I work on the sorts of things that William experienced, for example, in the LRA. And I examine, my work examines common atrocities during genocide for what they can tell us about genocide, the crime as a whole, right? That is about its definition, its meaning, its causes, its early warning, and its remediation after the fact. Um, gendered analysis and sexualized violence are central to the work that I do because I have found that the atrocities that are common to all cases of genocide, and then also to cases that aren't commonly conceived of as genocide but have a genocidal component, um, are themselves, that these common atrocities are themselves very gendered. 
and they frequently involved sexualized forms of torture and humiliation. So my work on gender and sexualized violence has actually grown out of my empirical understanding of the crime. I didn't start out studying genocide. Um, and it has in turn then also influenced radically um, and developed my understanding of the crime of genocide a great deal. Um, I have called the types of atrocities that I examine life force atrocities. And this is just to give you a sense of sort of the central core of my work and then I'm going to sort of make generalizations based on what I've learned through this research. And I call them life force atrocities because I argue that their logic betrays a preoccupation with the invisible source of life of the group being targeted. I believe that life force atrocities can act as evidence of genocidal intent and are in fact microcosms of the larger crime. The small groups that are targeted with life force atrocities are in a sense stand-ins for the larger groups that are to be destroyed. And we therefore can use life force atrocities as important early warning indicators of a potential genocide. For their presence demonstrates that certain cadres or chains of command or hierarchies have developed genocidal intent. Um, life force atrocities, I break them down into two types of rituals. The first are violent inversion rituals, which you find throughout genocides, that seek to reverse proper hierarchies and relationships within families and communi communities, and thereby to irrevocably uh, um, break sacred bonds, right, bonds that are considered sacred. Such acts include forcing family members to watch the rape, torture, and murder of their loved ones, as well as forcing them to participate in the perpetration of these crimes. The second type of life force atrocity is the ritual mutilation and desecration of deep symbols of group reproduction, including male and female reproductive organs, women's breasts, pregnant women as the loci of generative powers, and infants and small children as sacred symbols of the group's future. Um, and so these are things that you find common, right, to genocidal processes, and yet they've been largely overlooked as excess violence, as meaningless violence, right, that can't be a type of madness that overcomes perpetrators, and what I argue is that there's method to this madness, right, and really the devil of genocide is in the details of the types of crimes that are committed by the genocidaires. Now, in studying these ritualized atrocities, in the process of sort of looking at them and reading them and and trying to analyze them and bring some, some method to this madness. I have come to five basic conclusions about the study of gender and genocide, or the role played by gender and genocide. And this is going to echo some of the things you were saying, I think. One is that gender is not just an aspect of genocide that we, of which we need to be aware, right? But it is, in fact, essential to our understanding of the crime. If we really want to understand what's going on with genocide, we have to understand its gender dynamics, right? Um, my research has convinced me that genocide is really, in a sense, about gender. And you mentioned something akin to that. In as much as perpetrators target the reproduction of groups, when you want to kill a group, right, you want to stop its, its ability to reproduce itself in, in our world, right? Um, and as much as they're doing that, they are targeting the gendered processes that bring groups into being, right? Which are both biological and cultural, right? So there's the biological dimension of birthing children, but also the cultural dimension of organizing a society um, around a certain gender regime that ensures, right, that the culture and the symbols and the meaning of that society continues into the future. This becomes clear when one looks at the atrocities committed by perpetrators. If we view the spaces of atrocity, for example, as concentric circles moving outwards from the individual and the family, the types of ritual cruelties and inversions as well as desecrations that are committed against people as family members, as community members, as representatives of the larger group are very similar across cases. The destruction de and desecration of important cultural sites also follows a similar logic. So in genocide you find sort of well, we can see the pattern with ISIS, right, where um, men are frequently murdered, women and children are raped or enslaved, and then cultural institutions, right, are desecrated and destroyed in very similar fashions using similar logic. So the entire process of genocide is caught up in perpetrators' views of the social reproduction um, of social reproduction among target groups, as well as the gendered dimensions of the objective world in which perpetrators and victims live. So we can't really get away from gender when we're talking about genocide. 
And therefore, my second point is that gender is therefore about much, much more than direct killing. I think probably everyone in this room knows that, but it, it bears repeating because many of our definitions of genocide, and not the genocide convention, not the legal definition, right, but many of the sort of working scholarly definitions focus on killing, direct killing, right, as the main indicator of genocide. But in fact, one could argue that the difference between genocide and other forms of mass violence is precisely the role accorded to killing in the process. Genocide, unlike more limited forms of massacre, which are, are of course related to the process of genocide, but unlike these more limited forms, it aims at the temporal aspect of group life, not just its spatial aspect, right? So the goal is to destroy or weaken a group, not only in the present time by killing the bodies, right? But in perpetuity, and one could argue in eternity, so genocidaires cast their view backwards as well as forwards, erasing the past to erase the future. And this is why you find certain groups, target groups, right, um, or certain groups within the target groups that are generally in wartime conceived to be the least threatening, elderly people and babies, for example, being directly targeted for extremely cruel forms of treatment, right? So they are main targets of genocide, even though they pose no real physical threat to genocidaires, it's that existential threat, right, and that eternal threat that they're believed to pose in the mind of genocidaires that needs to be, that needs to be um, destroyed. So, um, so this is the case whether we're talking about a partial or a total genocide, to use the categories in the genocide convention, right, we can read kind of a genocidal logic from uh, this sort of temporal, right, temporal based uh, persecution. Now, sexual violence serves a very particular purpose then during genocidal processes. Um, for, as, as Jocelyn mentioned, it has shown itself to be an efficient means of weakening social cohesions for generations afterwards, right? But also it compromises the past as it exists in lived mem mem memory and shared traditions. So it compromises um, those. So that, that sort of shared culture, right, by tainting it through, the, through that process. Um, further, further, so point three, um, apart from being an efficient means of long-term destruction, sexualized violence, I want to propose, also has a genocidal logic to it, even in cases where it's not used as an explicit tool of genocide. That's something we can discuss more. I think I'm out of time, right? Okay, so that I want to throw out there, right, that there is something about sexualized violence that lends itself to genocide, and that's a point that has been made most recently by Catherine McKinnon in a really pathbreaking article called Genocide Sexuality. Um, and that this point about rape's internally genocidal logic has raised, for me at least, and this is my recent work, the importance of examining new roots for the identification and transmission of genocidal logics, ideologies, practices, institutions, cultures, and so forth during peacetime. So in other words, understanding rape and sexualized violence during peacetime is very important to our efforts at genocide prevention. We need to understand, in my view, genocide is the consequence not only of intergroup dynamics forged along ethnic, religious, national, and political lines, which are the commonly accepted sort of, um, sort of what it feeders for genocide, but also of pattern form, patterns formed along gendered lines. And therefore, we need to examine how peacetime gender regimes contribute to the development of genocidal ideologies and how they can make societies either more or less vulnerable, right, to genocidal ideology and genocidal practice. And I want to just close by noting that what's interesting is in genocide studies, right, uh, it's taken us this long, if you think the Genocide Convention was uh, sort of passed in 1948, right, it was agreed upon in 1948 in the UN, um, largely as a consequence of Raphael Lemkin, who was a Polish Jewish jurist, right, who sort of dedicated his life to the study of genocide. He coined the term, he drafted, right, early drafts of the convention um, and was studying genocide, aiming to uh, publish a three-volume history of genocide. Um, and it's taken us to this point, right, to really get to gender, to look at women, to include them in the story. But recently in my research, I've gone back to Lemkin's writings, and what happens is that, and this is often the case when you're doing gender, it was there all the time. His writings are replete with examples of sexualized violence against women and against men, 
right? He was a real empiricist. If it's there, he's going to talk about it and try and analyze it. It was replete with examples of gender-based violence that involved family structures and very gendered community structures. He was completely aware of the role that sexualized violence and gender-based violence play um, in the process of genocide. And yet he didn't have the language, right, or the analytical apparatus to talk about it, and it slowly got erased right, um, in the Genocide Convention and then in the subsequent scholarship. So we're sort of back to the future right, um, with this study. Um, and so it's very interesting, I think, to think about gender as something that has always been in genocide. It's always been in the writings on genocide, the early ones. right? It's in the convention, though it's not explicitly mentioned, but it informed the convention, and, and now we're now we're sort of going back to that those original insights and talking about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think I join my colleagues, and I, you know, I suppose it is not redundant to restate uh, that I am exceedingly grateful uh, to the organizers uh, of this uh, panel discussion. Uh, for rethinking scholarship, that is positioning scholarship at the intersection of research and publication and public welfare. Mm. I have not always worked on gender and genocide. I had my own conversion on the road to Damascus very recently. <laughs> but prior to that, between 2000 and 2006, my scholarship focused on memory and memorialization, uh, the comparative study of genocide, uh, Holocaust and genocide education in Africa, and in recent years, African perspectives on the Holocaust. I am trying to understand what colonial subjects in Africa knew and thought about the Holocaust. And wait until my book comes out. Uh, I think you will see me on CNN and other places. <laughs> uh, before I became a tenured professor, I did what every uh, assistant professor or historian was trained to do, uh, to do research and then publish and become a very dispassionate detective of the past. It was when I encountered the Nazi state, when I appeared in a BBC documentary on the Nazi state, uh, and when I encountered Father Nimola's soliloquy, uh, first they came for the Jews, and I did not speak up because I was not a Jew. Mm -hmm. Then they came for the communists, and I did not speak up uh, because I was not a communist, and they came for me. Uh, and at that time, there was nobody uh, to speak for me. It was my study of the Holocaust that has really propelled me to position my own scholarship at the intersection of historical research and public welfare. Because I have come to believe that when it comes to the defense of human rights, when it comes to the defense of the sanctity of human life, there is absolutely no room for intellectual uh, neutrality. Uh, and that has really been an abiding sense that I have cultivated uh, since my study uh, of the Holocaust. And there are three distinctive areas in which I have come to marry my own scholarship to public activism. In 2009, I was in my office when I had a call from Canada. Uh, a young lady uh, by name Hirut Abebe uh, wanted me to lend the little intellectual weight that I had garnered uh, in my own research uh, on the Holocaust and genocide uh, to support uh, a private endeavor that she had in mind to preserve a public memory. She herself had been sexually mutilated uh, in the course of the Ethiopian Revolution in the 1970s. Uh, she had been raped several times uh, by cadres of the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Uh, and uh, she had suffered all kinds of indignities that had remained, that had uh, made her uh, unable to even conceive uh, and, and reproduce. So she wanted to establish what she called the Ethiopian 
Red Terror Documentation and Research Center. And she wanted to find out if I could become a member uh, of the Global um, Governing Board. Uh, because of the interest that I was beginning to cultivate about not only cloistering my intellectual products uh, in some very reclusive journals uh, that nobody could read, but becoming a public intellectual uh, who would bring some of my scholarship uh, to the fore for people to look at, and then eventually uh, make common cause with other human rights activists to make the world better. I decided that I would serve on the board. Today, the Ethiopian Red Terror Documentation and Research Center is a very thriving research center that has made public many of the documents that were hidden in Ethiopia about the atrocities that women suffered in the course of the Ethiopian Revolution. It is through my collaboration with her on that particular project that I was invited by the African Union to advise it on how to build a human rights memorial in front of the headquarters of the African Union uh, building in Addis Ababa. In September 2013, when uh, I sat on a plenary session to give expression uh, to what I considered to be a necessary thing that we should do in Africa, I made the point to the African Union members that when they decide to build that human rights memorial, one section of that edifice should be devoted to the women who were sexually violated in the course of the Rwandan genocide in 1994. And I'm very happy to report that the memorialization, the Human Rights Memorial Project, uh, is uh, proceeding in earnest. The final point that I want to make in the interest of time, and where I see a convergence between my own scholarship and my public interest uh, activities, uh, is in 2014 when I decided that as perhaps the only African scholar who studies the Holocaust or genocide, there have been a few, so I have good company now, but not too long ago, I was the only African scholar in the world who studies genocide, who studied genocide uh, and the Holocaust. And I'm trying to coerce one of your finest scholars, uh, Moses Ochono, uh, to also become uh, a Holocaust and genocide studies scholar <laughs> so that uh, he could explore colonialism and public suffering. Uh, but in 2014, I decided to challenge the African continent and challenge my own country and thinking about sexual violence broadly. Sexual violence should not necessarily end at the frontier of rape of women, but we should also consider sexual violence as the persecution of people on grounds of their sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. As human beings, mm -hmm. we are bearers of a variety of characteristics. Not only do we bear physical appearance, not only do we bear epidermal coverings, but we are also bearers of distinctive, different, and even dissident sexualities. So I decided to speak in Accra, my own country, about the necessity for a diverse Africa to tolerate diversity, no matter how sexually uh, it is expressed. Uh, in fact, they wanted to burn me alive. <laughs> uh, and some of my own colleagues and mentors at the University of Ghana felt that if I had anything of substance to contribute to the African continent for development, the least I could do was to defend the humanity of homosexuals. I argued in return that scholarship has absolutely no boundaries for the conscientious intellectual. And it is imperative that at this particular moment, not only do we have to speak truth to power, and protecting women who have suffered grave indignities in the hands of perpetrators of violence, but also recognize the necessity for us to integrate our own kinds and our own kith and kin who happen to be homosexuals, gay, lesbians, and bisexuals into our broader conception of humanity. 
immediately after my lecture at the University of Ghana, I was condemned by the president of Equatorial Guinea. I mean, for a short person like me to be taken seriously by a president uh, of an African continent really gave me uh, more impetus to even uh, make my loudest expressions even louder beyond the Sahara Desert. So I wrote an open letter to him. Uh, and in that open letter, I drew his attention to Father Nimola's soliloquy. And I argued that it is important for us to learn about what happened in Nazi Germany. Had the Nazis succeeded beyond the Holocaust, what probably could have been next would have been a homocaust, a complete destruction of homosexuals. And I do not want my continent, Africa, to tread that road. So these are some of the things that I have done, and I hope to tell you more during question time. So I will be talking about then the Holocaust and how I came to make a book with my colleague Rochelle Seidel, who has written on the women's camp at Ravensbrück during World War II and why we came to make a book on sexual violence against Jewish women during the Holocaust. And I want to preface what I'll say with the words of the feminist Andrea Dworkin, who in the year 2000 wrote in her book called Scapegoat the following, and it was very controversial. So 15 years ago, she published this. She asked, why isn't a raped woman the symbol of the Holocaust? And why isn't rape part of all the exhibits in all the museums and all the memorials? The book that I made with Rochelle Seidel was, came out of this kind of pain of having questioned at Holocaust events when my colleague said that women in the women's camp at Ravensbrück were raped when she was told she should not say that, can it be proved? And it, these are eminent scholars on the Holocaust had questioned where are the documents. And both Dr. Seidel and I looked at each other, in particular this was in 2006 at Yad Vashem in Israel, the uh, Holocaust Authority, and we said, we know scholars who are working on this, so why is this a question, where are the documents? And let me ask you, does a rape victim have to provide a document from the perpetrator saying, indeed, this happened? And when you reflect on the situation in our society in particular, how much silence is there around rape? We live in a rape culture. So going back to the Holocaust, this is called the Holocaust Lecture Series. And certainly, as my colleague said, the Holocaust is a touchstone for genocide. And we must ask about sexual violence during that time. So the Holocaust is a little bit different, and maybe we'll tease this out in questions and answers in our discussion in that the Holocaust, in the Holocaust rape was not intended as a weapon of war against the enemy. When rape occurred, and uh, it did, and in fact, Dr. Seidel and I are starting to think that it was all pervasive, but the silence around it was so effective that no one looked at it and certainly no one talked about it, much like we continue today. And I don't mean in this august company here. And regarding the Holocaust, there was this idea that Jewish women, women would not be raped by Nazis in particular because the belief was in the Rassenschande, the German law, that there would not be a uh, desecration or defilement of the German Aryan race. Well, that was the law. Let me ask you. We have laws against rape. Does that prevent rape? Is this total nonsense? So indeed, this happened. 
And in fact, last week on Tuesday in New York, I was there for the panel discussion afterwards. An Israeli filmmaker, Rani Salnat, made a new documentary for Channel One on Israeli television. It's a documentary in which she interviews nine people, women and men, who were raped as children by Nazis and their collaborators. And these nine brave souls, four have passed away in the interim, had the courage to speak out, saying that they were really afraid that their children would find out about this because their children might never talk to them again. So we're losing these voices. So as we look at other genocides, wouldn't you just love to say we don't have this in our world anymore? Wouldn't you just love to say that we respect each other and we don't use other people's bodies for whatever our intention is, but emphasis on use, using other people? So let's not lose the voices of those that are being victimized as we speak. So what I have seen in the past five years, thinking about, excuse me, this panel <coughs> this evening, at an event after the book on sexual violence against Jewish women during the Holocaust came out, it is an anthology. Uh, there are 16 contributors from around the world to that book. At, a, at a, the Brooklyn Museum, we had an event with Gloria Steinem, and uh, one of the participants, she said, I don't want to get up in the front and talk about it, and she'd never talked about it. A person from Rwanda who had <coughs> been sexually abused and had suffered the horrors of war, she said, no, I can't speak. I've never talked about it. And in fact, her fate was that she was then HIV positive after having been raped. So she didn't talk, but in the Q&A, uh, Q question and answer, she was in line. She actually happened to be the last speaker, and she told her story. And in the next year, she wrote a book. So thinking about what it is, is that when we work together, when we speak with each other, when we connect the dots, when we give each other courage, then we can move ahead and progress as we would like to as civil societies around the globe. So while there are suggestions, there are NGOs, we have the UN, we have uh, organizations who are working to eradicate genocide in the best sense, let me just leave us with what Konsole Nishimwe, the uh, Rwandan victim, what she says in her book. Because what, I don't know how it is for you. I'm a little person living in Tennessee. I live down the road from you in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Can you imagine? And sometimes the world is a really big place to negotiate and I want to cure everything that ails it and I just want to sit in a little hole because I don't know what to do. This is what Console says. In this life here on earth, there is no better way of bringing joy and harmony to your heart and soul than being kind to others, to help whoever you can, and to empathize from the heart with those less fortunate than you are. Sometimes we say to ourselves that we don't have much to offer, but I believe that simply giving love from your heart and a caring smile to the downtrodden is enough to show that you care. And you may think, well, that sounds very Pollyanna, like Pollyanna, right? It's very, you know, uh, smiles. But she offers that if we give a smile to each other, that is the beginning of love. Let me say, I've worked.